technique to straighten the shot, but that remains top secret for the time being. <laughs> All right. Now I'd like to welcome up my friends Chris and Lisa Kirk of Telperion Farms. Let's give them a round of applause. Please get comfortable. Move things around as you need. First, I'd just like to say thank you, everybody, for... Thank you, everybody, for coming. This has been... And obviously an emotional one, but it's great to see everybody really, really enjoying the trees that we put so much love and effort into. So thank you, everybody. Yeah. And uh, thanks for letting us old folks sit, sit down. <laughs> <laughs> so it's been suggested that we might start with giving you a quick history of how the farm came to be. Uh, so many years ago, Lisa and I moved to Alabama. We both worked in medicine, and we had the first time in our life that we had every weekend free. And uh, Lisa looked at me and said, I need a hobby. Uh, turned out the Alabama Bonsai Society was having their annual show. So we went, and uh, they're, they're a big group. We got into bonsai that way. And uh, got into the commercial side because uh, they would the club would go to buy trees for demos and stuff. The largest bonsai nursery in the country happens to be so, quick drive over there. Uh, um, and uh, then when we uh, had a chance to come back to Oregon, we looked around and said, well, let grow some trees there. Yes. And so we started experimenting, and we, we actually had a farm before the Kirk farm uh, down by Eugene, and then work issues prompted us to move and we found Telperian Farms. I remember the the uh, realtor saying to Lisa, what do you think? And she says, well, we just need to wipe the drool off his chin. <laughs> <laughs> the important part is to remember that this poor realtor had taken us every weekend for eight months looking for the perfect property. So when, and it was just right at the beginning of internet, so everything was still really just on, her little book and everything like that. So she takes us out. I actually had pneumonia, so I stayed in the car. And as he was walking around, she's like, well, what makes this one different? I'm like, I promise you, just get the papers out. And he got in the car, and he's like, let's make a full price offer. <laughs> uh, one of our success factors at the farm that doesn't get mentioned much is this whole deal of water pH. The, the water at Temperian comes out of the ground at a pH of 4.5. Wow. So... Um, the trees love that, and we uh, we just started uh, putting trees in the ground and experimenting with things. Uh, it, when we were in Alabama, we had met Mr. Wood, and he was already good friends, so um, he came out and helped us out a little bit. So many years later, he explained to me that when he saw us planting trees in bags, he thought we were just knocking futs. <laughs> uh, but he didn't say so. And then a few years later, we started taking those trees out of the ground, and he said, oh, holy shit, boss, you got a gold mine here. <laughs> so uh, we, uh, we just experimented with things, and, and we got lucky. Uh, we found good sources for trees. Heritage Seedlings is a mile away from us. And that's where we got most of our maple starts. Uh, Brooks Tree Farm. Uh, is a couple miles away, and they uh, they specialize in producing thousands of cuttings for reforestation. And uh, so I talked to them, and they did some Japanese black pine every year. And their their Japanese black pine seedlings are like this big. So I asked them to save the small ones for me. We got started with doing that. Um, it was mentioned the other day about looking for good genetics in trees to follow, and uh, there happened to be that a friend of mine owns a nursing home not far from there, and uh, Wood and I were there one day, and here were some Japanese maple landscape trees. They were 50, 60 years old, and looked, and uh, all leaves, uh, inner nodes were literally that far apart. 
So we asked, you know, can we propagate this? And Ren said, yeah. And I always remember we were out there one day up on ladders, plucking seeds off these trees, and one of the residents of the nursing home came by and said, what are you boys doing there? And Wood said, well, we're picking these seeds off of this tree. He says, why? And Wood said, we're going to make a pie. <laughs> and she, she said, yeah, okay. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, things, things just progressed. We, uh, we literally uh, got, got more stuff in the ground than we could take care of. There were just too many trees we had. Uh, of course, we had health problems and all this other stuff going on. Um, but uh, I, I finally retired from my day job. And we thought we finally had a situation where we really had enough time to take care of all the trees. Um, and then uh, about 2 o'clock in the morning one night, Roxy, if you've been to the farm, you know Roxy worked for us. Her uh, brother is a sheriff, and so uh, she got notified. We didn't. Uh, she knocked on our door and said, you got about 15 minutes to get out of here if you want to live. And so we grabbed the dogs and tried to dive, drive down the road. <laughs> there was a tree across the driveway, of course. And uh, luckily, I'd been trimming trees that day and had a chainsaw and a gator, so we got that out of the way. And, uh, drove down the road and got on the highway with literally thousands of other cars. The fire came down the valley driven by a 70 mile an hour wind. Uh, destroyed two or three complete towns, 500 homes. It was so hot it, it melted our cars. But we got out okay and uh, went looking for a place to rent. Uh, Nobody would rent to us because of our dogs. We had a pair of Rottweilers, and if you knew them, you know they're big babies. But nevertheless, our friends Sean and Bonnie uh, said, well, stay with us. And their 18-year-old their daughter said, you can hire uh, So I often characterize this ordeal as I shared a bathroom with three teenage girls for 10 weeks. <laughs> <laughs> But through that, um, I'll have to go slowly here. Every time we uh, could have uh, wallowed in our sorrow, we were instead reminded that uh, We were swept up in the arms of angels, cleverly disguised as bonsai people and other friends. We had so many phone calls that went like this. Chris, this is Joe. Don't want to take up much of your time. I just want you to know that whatever you need, whatever you need, you call me. Thanks, bye. <clears throat> Those of you who know Lisa, you know she knits. But it's not a hobby. She's a professional knitter. She's part of a design team that creates new designs for sweaters and stuff. And uh, so it was actually the knitters who, who started the GoFundMe campaign. And uh, we finally were able to get into a house. And this was, it was COVID and it was supply chain stuff. And we were shopping, you know. Yeah, I'd like that couch. Oh, good. I can get that for you in six weeks. Um, and so the uh, she was talking to the knitting people, and they said, you guys, we have a house full of furniture, a big truck, and several strong young men. You just say when. So, um, again, well, uh, we might have been wallowing in our pity. Instead, we were 
just constantly overwhelmed by uh, generosity in Christian. I'm um, Karen and Sue, and then all of the guys all came in. Very, it was still red skies. There was smoke all over. Um, some of the dug furs on the property actually burned for three weeks. When we would go out there, the bases were still on fire. Um, the house was a three-story farmhouse, and let's just say I had a lot of stuff in there. Um, <laughs> and it all reduced down to eight inches of ash. Um, and we have been really blessed. The people who bought the land um, have allowed us to be grandparents, um, and they invite us out all the time. But the other part, too, is there still are some trees that are in the field um, that, you know, the top roots had escaped and things like that. But using toms, using mats. Um, so if anybody wants to go out there and just look around and see what maples or what black pines, Scots pines might still be alive and worth, you know, taking the time. And, you know, it's, it's as we used to say, um, and Andrew has it on his uh sweatshirt. Mr. Wood's favorite thing was two more years. So that's always been our kind of joke logo is it, it'll be a good tree in just two more years. So if anybody wants Heather and Logan's information, please um, come see me afterwards and I'm happy to give you her phone number so you can text and everything like that. And um, when Chris and I moved back, he was like, well, honey, maybe I could have an acre. And I was like, oh, OK, because I grew up in Oregon, and acres manageable. Um, 104 acres later, <laughs> we created uh, Toparian Farms. And um, really, honestly, we didn't exactly know what we were doing. And seeing one of the pictures, I was like, who are those people? They're such babies. <laughs> and, um, but uh, we learned lots and lots of different techniques. Um, you know, one of the uh, maples that John has, I'm pretty sure in that Anderson tray, if you pull it up, there's either going to be a geodesk that's grown into the roots, or there's a little tile that we had drilled through and put the little seedlings through. And every single one of the trees started out like those trees on this first table. They were small little whips that we put into one gallon pots. And uh, I had begged Chris when you're like, do we have to put gravel in the bottom of the pots? It's so heavy when I'm trying to move them. And he's like, well, and I was like, just one year. Well, I learned that I lost two years of growth by not putting the rocks in the bottom of the pot kind of thing. And the same with the bags. Um, when we put them in the ground, we very carefully did the drip lines and you know hooked them in with three hooks and crawled on the thing. But we put the drips on like this, because the tree was only like this, never realizing it was going to get like this big. Um, and filled the 10-inch bag much, much faster than um, we had ever dreamed possible to do it. And hopefully, we passed a bunch of that knowledge on to John so that he knows exactly <laughs> what mistakes not to make whenever you're putting them in the ground. But all of the shimpakus are all from a, a Japanese tree that we had brought back when we went to um, Kokofu right before we bought the farm. And we had met um, a gentleman there who said, oh, you just hit the cuttings, root them in some pumice with more mat. And then the most important thing is you tie them in a knot, stick them in the pot, and come back in five years, and you'll have a tree. And we're like, OK, like this thing is less than this size. And he was right that those trees are no more than 20, 25 years um, that are at the farm. So any of the big, big butts that you guys see, um, those are all from teeny, tiny little trees that we started with. Um, I'm not sure everybody else has 25 years, because we don't anymore. Um, but we still have five trees that are in the backyard that everybody has saved for us. Um, I still have my uh, choked by quince which is one of my absolute favorite ones. Um, and then um, uh, after the fire, uh, Andrew has one of the pictures of all the trees that he had rescued. Matt rescued, Michael rescued, um, uh, John rescued. So we're really, really grateful. Um, 
But do you guys have any questions about our experiences growing trees and what we might have learned or not learned um, that we could pass on to you guys for any questions or how you put them in pots um, to sort of get more ra rapid growth on them? Mm -hmm. uh, thank you for what you guys did. First of all, uh, so your trees, it's fantastic. Uh, I've got a trident, a really wide base. How did you get such huge bases on, on some of those tridents? Um, yeah. Luck and miracle grow. <laughs> um, one year, uh, Chris and Gary wanted miracle grow, and I was feeling very frugal. I'm like, no, I'm not buying you miracle grow. It's too expensive. I'll buy you the generic 20, 20, 20. It'll be fine. Well, it wasn't. I'm not sure what miracle grow puts in it, but. I will swear by Miracle Grow. And we never used organics just because there were so many critters out. Um, we did buy uh, the fertilizer from Jan and her husband. Um, and Ozzy, our male dog, proceeded to eat the entire bag of it in the greenhouse one afternoon. Um, so after that, we stopped doing any kind of organics. Um, and it was strictly Miracle Grow in. Um, uh, we had injectors that we did, so every time the trees um, got fed or got watered, they got fed with just a little bit of Miracle Grow. They, and then some of those ones actually have. It was there a tile in there when you repotted it. Yeah, there was like the geodesk or yeah. the fabric, yeah. whatever that's called. We we had been putting tiles under trees. Frankly, hard to find tiles. So we decided to try the geodisks. The geodisks, for those who know, are a, a fabric that's impregnated with copper that's designed to go on the top of a pot to help with weed and And we used them for that. Um, but then we thought, well, if they're impregnated with copper, then roots aren't going to grow through them. So we started taking a couple of geodisks and putting them up under the tree instead of a ceramic tile. And it all worked out really nice, especially because they only cost. Yeah, well, and it, it just causes that flare. And like Tom, um, in one of the trees that he, um, I think, Jonas? Um, so when he originally got it in the bag, all you could see was about this much. But when he did the top down one, it actually is like this big now. So. Um, some of those uh, were just random good looks. Um, and then uh, I would say one of the biggest downfalls when you're out looking at trees was where the um, uh, water drip line bit into them. So some of those trees either will never barely be a great bonsai, it just needs to really be like a yard, black pine. Um, when, and if you, spend a lot of time working on it and feed it really hard, you might be able to get that to grow out. Um, but that, that definitely was one of our lessons learned on don't put things too close to the trunks if you're trying to really get that big growth. So here's the quick version of how we did that. Uh, we would take trident cuttings and root them in pumice. Um, and then a year later, we'd take them out and uh, put them into a one gallon nursery pot or a, a root grow nursery pot and we would we would prune the roots so that they would lay out flat on top of the soil and then some soil on top of that. Now when the trees grow in pots you've all noticed they grow out to the edge to go to hit the pot and they go down. And we where that happens we call that a knee. So a year later we pull the trees out of the one gallon pots and prune the roots to the knees. So they're still going out straight. So you might rearrange the roots a little bit to get a nice radial spread. Uh, and uh, put your geodisc in the root control bag, a little handful of soil on top of that. Set the tree there. Um, spread the roots, soil on top of that, and let it grow. We, we, uh, there's some simple little things that we discovered the first time we uh, tried that. I uh, took all my trees in root control bags and put them in the back of the gator and drove out to put them in the ground. And when I got out there, I had 
empty root control bag because I'd jostled it so much the cuttings fell out. So we learned that we could do the process very early in the spring, like in February, in the greenhouse. And that would let them grow and establish in the root control bag enough that we could move them around without them falling out. You know, simple, simple little things. Um, so, um, yeah, we, we let them grow. And with the tridents, more than the pines, we would um, prune off the, the sacrifice leaders a little earlier. Oh. Like before taking it out of the ground, prune it off, or after it was out of the ground? Oh yeah, yeah, we would, we would do directional pruning while it was in the ground. And then w at what point would you transfer it to the Anderson tray? Because I know that you got the pumice beds. Yeah. Well, one, it's, uh, <clears throat> you know, you usually would say, well, it's been three or four years, let's take a look. And you look and see what you have. Uh, and quite frankly, some of them are like, Oh, this will make a nice show in. Uh, and some of them were really big, and so they would be transferred uh, either to an Anderson tray. Um, we, we did do a few trees. Everybody, they mentioned these were 10-inch root control bags. Well, they make root control bags in all sizes. But we did take a few trees and transfer them into 12-inch bags and put them back in the ground. I never got to see all of that, but... If, 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 the, if the base was big enough and the bari was what we wanted, then we went to an Anderson tray because we knew they weren't going to grow very much in an Anderson tray. And if they weren't big enough, we either um, put them back in a bag, back in the ground, maybe a five-gallon nursery pot, something like that. Uh, and, and quite frankly, um, we came to realize that... Um, not everybody in the world wanted a 50-pound bonsai. <laughs> so uh, the opportunity with those smaller trees for, for marketing was one thing we tried to take advantage of. Questions? Yes, sir. Uh, the, the miracle grow like ratio to give just, just the right amount at that steady street. There's like an instructions on the box for that, or yeah, ignore those. Um. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we used the uh, Easy Flow injectors um, that were a gallon ones, and it, you hook them up in the water line. So even if you're just watering with a hose and a rose at the end of it, you can hook one of those injectors in, and it was a one-pound bag of Miracle Grow into the one gallon one and then we just water it till the blue was gone and then I dump another um, one pound bag into it. So that comes out to a very dilute solution. Yeah. You know, if you took regular uh, miracle Grow uh, and put, I don't know, half a teaspoon in a two gallon watering can, it'd be something like that. Very dilute, but it was every day. Yeah. And all the trees that were in the nursery pots or out of the ground at a point, um, I hand watered those every morning um, for probably the last five years of, of the farm. Um, and part of that was just keep track of them and making sure that they weren't drying out. Um, and then I'd also rotate them um, every month. I'd turn them a quarter turn so that all summer long they were getting different areas of sun on the different parts of the tree. The ones in the field, um, they had drip lines, and then uh, they fended for themselves in the winter. <laughs> we, uh, you, you worry about over-fertilizing your trees, and, and it's interesting that when we've been in Birmingham, there's a, a group of guys who grew trees together, they were kind of nuts, and at one time they decided, let's see how much fertilizer it takes to, to burn a trident, and it's a lot. <laughs> um, the, uh, other, the other thing is we always started fertilizing um, toward the end of February. Um, I don't know if you guys kind of noticed in Oregon, you know, we get that sort of nice week in January, and then there's that really nice week in at the end of February where then we have to frantically run around trying to get the lines all, all online because we took everything in so it wouldn't freeze. 
Um, but that little week in there is when we started fertilizing. So we fertilized um, probably almost nine months of the year with the miracle Grow. So this is the, the black pine technique. Pick a leader, a nice leader, and you strip all the needles off the trunk. Leave just that at the top. See our black pines produced uh, needles uh, at the top candles uh, that could be 24 inches long, uh, and so that's that's how we got the great big growth. If we had continued doing it, we would have modified our technique to remove those sacrifice leaders sooner, so that we wouldn't have such big scars to heal. Sorry, go ahead. From a business perspective, were you plant? What were you using for your target numbers in the ground, and what did you see the market doing as you were building up your nursery and planting with the potential of 104 acres if you ever chose to? We had no idea. <laughs> uh, I will tell you, um, you know, we both were working professionals, and to bring the farm to the point that it reached was an investment of about a million dollars. Um, we started out, uh, uh, not knowing how we're gonna market this, well, here, we're gonna go back some years. And then along came eBay. Do you ever remember when there wasn't eBay? <laughs> um, and we went to eBay college. Uh, so we tried eBay and then we uh, uh, started our own website. Um, we uh, used uh, 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 postal connections to do our shipping for us until somebody said, you guys are getting ripped off on your shipping. And then we, we started doing our own direct shipping. And at the height of it, we'd probably ship, you know, FedEx would come to the farm. We'd probably ship two or three trees a day. And once in a while, we'd get some really uh, anxious customers, and, and they'd want trees big enough, we'd have to put them on pallets, ship them that way. Uh, shipping, there were, there were definitely times when customers said, well, I can't afford a tree if the shipping is that much. Well, that's, that's the budget. So we, um, we didn't know. We, we, we pretty much knew that we weren't going to get rich selling bones, right? Um, we, uh, just kept trying to expand the market. I remember, uh, who was it that was at the farm? One of the European artists walked through and he said, you know, Chris, we don't do black pines in Europe. We do Scots pine. And so next year we were growing Scots pines. And I remember we, we had some quince in the ground and Mr. Hagedorn came home from Japan and was walking around and he, he said, oh, do you have any chojibai? No. He said, he said, I love chojibai red. <laughs> Next year we had chojibai red. Uh, so we, uh, we tried to respond to the market in that way. Well, and, and it's definitely changed because you know, when we first started, we were just bonsai enthusiasts. We would go to conventions as guests. And then when we finally had enough trees and some tools, because it was much easier to get tools from Japan back then, um, we'd have our little table and people would walk by and then, you know, we'd sell two or three trees and we're super excited. Um, and then um, as we got busier and we had people traveling um, and Dave, well, know the story of a gentleman down in Texas um, was going to have this master come, Mr. DeGroote. Do we know him? And we're like, yes. So we sent a tree down to him, and of course it was in a bag. Um, but we had told um, Dave to say, hey, where'd you get this scrawny little tree from? <laughs> and, um, so having 
actually, I mean, we moved back to Oregon, as Chris will tell you, he wanted to be the perfect son-in-law, so he moved me back home closer to my family. Um, but we got really lucky because um, Mike Hagedorn returned, Ryan came, Matt came, um, and then now Andrew, Bobby, um, everybody, John, are all in the, in the area, so when they'd have their classes and their seminars, they were very gracious and they would have their students come down to look at trees with us. And that really, with the marketing of going to vending and doing conventions and also Portland becoming more of a premier um, bonsai space really helped um, change our focus on how we were growing trees and the trees that you needed to cull versus the trees that had excellent potential of being um, a tree bonsai. You know, one of the factors that helped us decide not to try to recreate the farm, aside from, you know, in a couple of weeks I'll be 71, um, was uh, we looked at these guys and we said, I think we've done enough. Mm -hmm. I, I think we've passed on enough knowledge to these guys that they can pick up the ball and continue with what we were doing. And, uh, yeah. We like so. to say that all the trees that survived the fire in 1,200 degrees are now happy with the next generation of bonsai artists. Mm -hmm. but, um, so. we, we really appreciated, uh, you know, I put out the call uh, and people came the day after the fire. Uh, didn't have any trouble getting up the hill because the, the police actually hadn't had time to arrange roadblocks. They did later. And uh, I said, mm -hmm. just pick up whatever you can carry and take it home. And, and somebody said, uh, Chris, I can't pay you for this. I said, I don't care. We've already had a tragedy. The bigger tragedy would be for the trees that are here to die for lack of care, because we had no water. Their, their power didn't come back to the farm for six months. So uh, um, the trees that are there that are alive now um, either have big escape routes or Roxy took it upon herself to uh, fill up water tanks in the back of a gator and actually go out and, and water some trees. But they told us just last week they're not going to do that anymore. They, their trees will not get watered this summer. So if anybody wants one last chance, uh, it's time to go. And then um, this is a credit to our photographer, Tom. This was uh, 2017, and we were lucky enough that we were a quarter mile from the direct line of the solar eclipse. Um, so one of our favorite memories is uh, we had all of our bonsai friends. Um, we had people who came to look for trees. And oh, by the way, can we watch that eclipse? Um, but my brother-in-law, the year before the eclipse, he's like, um, my niece and nephew call me Cisa because my nephew couldn't say Lisa when he was little. So they're like, this is going to be right next to Cisa's house. We need to go. So we had 40 people from Seattle who came down, and then we had um, all of our bonsai people came out to the farm to see. And um, Tom had set up his camera to take uh, the picture of totality. So that's one of my absolute favorite memories of the farm. People ask us, where's the pictures of all the people who came out to see the eclipse? And I, I look at the pictures and it's, it's people all standing there like this. <laughs> <laughs> not, not, not great photography, you know. Yeah. Um, do you guys have any more questions? Yeah, where'd the name Telperion come from? Oh, oh. okay. <laughs> this was a very, very long discussion between the two of us. It was it's worse a, than naming a child. Yeah. We went looking for a name, uh, something clever, and I thought, let's, let's name the farm after a druid goddess. <laughs> well, guess what? <laughs> Druids don't have goddesses. They worship trees. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, um, I'm, I'm a Hobbit fan. And, uh, and I've never, ever, ever read the books, even after all these years. <laughs> if you... Uh, read Tolkien's books uh, from before The Hobbit, 
uh, way back in the early days of Middle Earth when all the trees walked and talked. The oldest tree in the forest was Telperion. And the stars were created from the dew that fell from his leaves. And it, it goes on. Uh, and so we picked up here. Um, and we actually even contacted um, the uh, J.R. Tolkien family to make sure that we were not, you know, avoiding any copyrights or doing anything like that to name it Telperion. And, and they were like, no, that's totally fine. And, and thanks for asking. Um, and then Chris designed the logo. And then um, I don't know if you guys noticed on all the pictures that Scott did, he actually retraced because um, we lost all of that information. He actually retraced it by hand um, to make all of the signs and everything like that. So yeah. that he's, he's an amazingly talented bonsai artist, but also a graphic artist, too. It's, uh, I, I have to admit, I'm a little bit jealous looking around the room to see the Telperian shirts because <laughs> we, we lost everything. I, I don't own anything with a Telperian logo on it oh, anymore. That is not true. So uh, my mother uh, made it to age 90, oh, and yeah. um, our big joke was she got things and saved them for good. Like, no matter what we gave her for a holiday, it was saved for good. Um, so it was a long-standing joke. And then, of course, I had the bathroom towels that you couldn't touch because those were the saving for good towels. Um, and she um, had gotten a hat at some point when we were giving hats out for something. So she had one of the original Tarparian hats um, in her closet. So right after the fire, um, she was 88, I guess, by then. She goes toddling in with her little walker into her bedroom and comes out with this hat that says Tarparian Farms on it. But it's like one of the original logo ones. It's like, we didn't even keep that logo exactly. I mean, it's similar, but not quite. So he does have the... We I saved it for that. good hat. Yeah, I do have that one. <laughs> um, what's our time schedule? Who's running this show? Mm. Two, more Two more minutes. Two more minutes. One Any more, more question? question. Um, you mentioned uh, the water quality um, on one of the uh, things you were looking for in the farm. What, what else were you looking for that it took so long to actually make you want to pull the trigger? And... So, yeah. well... I wanted a house that didn't have plywood floors in the bottom of it. Um, and it was interesting. So one or two acres was within our price range. Anything between three and 20 was completely out of our price range. We, we just couldn't afford it. Um, so we had not intended to get anywhere near 104 acres. But um, we only went to look at this place because there was another 1970s kind of ranch one that we were getting ready to make a bid on. And Chris just wanted to see this one last place. Um, but it was, it was like the whole compound, that there was um, room for the greenhouses to be put in. We had a huge um, area. But the drainage was really nice. And it was 1,200 um, feet above sea level. So we got a little more growing season like down in Salem itself. That, it, was, um, it was a cattle ranch. So there was pasture, yeah. and, and part of it was planted in dug fir, but there was several acres of pasture. Yeah. And there were five ponds that we could irrigate from, and it had water rights. Um, yeah. So that was also another big one. Yeah. And it was on the side of the mountain, and it was just, it was beautiful. That was really one of the reasons that, um, and it's, it's still beautiful, just in a different way now. And I don't know how these guys... Uh, uh, are going to produce trees if they've got to pay for city water. Uh, we, <laughs> yeah, but that was one of the nice things. We we had um, a cistern in the pond, so we if, never worried yeah. about how much water we were if using. If you have not analyzed your water, you should talk to Tom. Uh, Tom is a fantastic bonsai artist, but he could not get his pines to thrive. And, and uh, so this is Elias. he finally tested his water, and the pH was, what was it in originally? 8.5 to 9. 8.5 to 9. From a well. And they, so, they have well water. So he, he put in a, a water tank and started acidifying his water with muriatic acid. Yeah. And in two weeks, 
it was night and day. So if, if any of you are, are finding that things aren't thriving the way you want, I would really suggest testing your water. You can take it to a lab and have it tested or just go to the, the jacuzzi store and get a pH test kit. You know, It's worth doing. All are we right. out of time? I think we've used all of our time. I think we cut into everyone's lunch hour. But, uh, so once again, you guys, thank you so, so much. This has been an amazing weekend. Yeah.